1981, a year of heroes and villains, artists and athletes. Where were you when Yuri Gagarin became the first man to travel in space? When America sent its first woman sailor to sea? When the man in the glass booth, Adolf Eichmann, was sentenced for his crimes against humanity? When Steve Reeves gave a stunning performance in the last days of Pompeii? Whatever happened to Steve Reeves, we'll show you as we recall 1961. Where were you? In 1961, television's almost manic preoccupation with the Wild West had switched to the Wild City. And every Wednesday night, we watched a sprawling hour-long drama which had everybody saying there are eight million stories in the naked city. I want you to tell me everything that's happened. Personally, go slow. Okay, I have it all here. The accident occurred at approximately 7.15 a.m., Mike. The coffin was thrown free of the hearse. Contact with the curb knocked the lid open. Whereupon... Go on, go on. The whereupon is the important part to me. Whereupon the corpse, description, male Caucasian, age approximately 60. The corpse jumped up and ran down Mulberry Street. There are eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. And there were eight million commercials on television. This was one of them. To get soft water, call your Culligan man. Hey, Culligan man! But Culligan means soft water. Hey, Culligan man. Pretty soft, huh? Little girls have pretty curls, but I like Oreo. Oreos, my choice, because it's the very best cookie ever was. Girls are nice, but boy, what icing comes with Oreos. This wasn't a commercial. It was an invention that didn't make it. The Amphicar. Even though it didn't go under, it didn't sell. Just treaded water. They finally deep sixed it. Nineteen sixty one was the year of the seat belt. In 1961, a major auto manufacturer took a bold step in the cause of road safety by furnishing seat belts at cost for all cars, including competitors' makes. All the songs on this program were the top tunes of 1961, and these were some of the best sellers. Ever make her blue. In April of nineteen sixty one, Russia put the first man into space orbit, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. I'm a traveling man, made a lot of stops all over the world, and in every port I own the heart. I do not to regard the first man in space as a sign of the weakening of the, uh, of the uh, free world, but I do regard the total mobilization of men and uh, things for the service of the communist bloc over the last years as a source of great danger to us. And I would say we're going to have to live with that danger and hazard uh, through much of the rest of this century. Yes, I'm a traveling man. 
Less than a month later, we sent our own astronaut into space, Alan Shepard. In contrast to Russian secrecy, we showed the world. I couldn't sleep at all last night. Shepard's capsule was first tested by these chimps early in 1961. They provided medical data and were trained to push levers on light signals. Because the chimps were less interested in the space race than in something to eat, food was the reward for hitting the right combination of switches. Three in a row wins the jackpot. This monkey business was all in the name of science. Nineteen sixty one. Where were you when our first woman Navy officer put to sea? When justice finally caught up with Adolf Eichmann. These moments in history after this. Nineteen sixty one was the year of the man in the glass booth, a story that began in the horror of Nazi concentration camps and had an equally grim ending. After a long trial, Adolf Eichmann was sentenced for his crimes against humanity. Justice had prevailed. Three judges heard testimony in Israel. The trial ended in August. It is now December 1961. He was together with others during the period 1939 to 1945, caused the killing of millions of Jews in his capacity as the person responsible for the execution of the Nazi plan for the physical extermination of the Jews, known as the final solution of the Jewish problem. Eichmann's sentence is death. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Germany, East Berlin authorities ordered that all U.S. personnel must show identification before entering the Eastern Sector. American troops answer with the only language the Russians seem to understand, a show of arms. The 1961 trouble with the Congo started in 1960 when Army strongman Mobutu took over the government and Patrice Lumumba, Prime Minister of the Congo, was murdered by rebels in a government coup. It was one of a series of mutinies, and the UN sent troops to help restore order. Anti-UN demonstrations flared up worldwide. Finally, to the doorstep of the United Nations itself in New York, our ambassador to the UN, Adlai Stevenson, took a strong stand. The Cold War out of the Congo is to keep the United Nations in the Congo. And we call on the Soviet Union to join us in thus ensuring the free and untrammeled exercise by the Congolese people of their right to independence and to democracy. The session is disrupted by Congolese radicals. I say that I deeply deplore this outrageous and obviously organized demonstration. In 1961, the Navy sends its first woman sailor to sea. She's Lieutenant Charlene Sunnison, and the sign on the door says it all. In 1961, we lost that great lady of primitive art, Grandma Moses. She left us a rich heritage of American treasures that she began painting at age 70. She was 101.
Do you remember this song? Step right up, folks, and see little Egypt do a famous dance in the pyramids. She walks, she talks, she crawls on her belly like a reptile. Just one thin dime, one tenth of a dollar. Step right up, folks. I went and bought myself a ticket and I sat down in the very first Miss International Beauty was picked in 1961. You will note that the hypermammiferous curvature was in that year. Sixty-one. Where were you when the guns of Navarone exploded across the screen? When Pompeii suffered its last days, and whatever happened to Pompeii's hero, Steve Reeves? An update coming up. By 1961, a former Mr. America had made it big on the screen in a series of Italian-made historical potboilers, first as the indomitable Hercules, and then a whole string of so-called spaghetti sagas that called for a lot of might and a curly mane. Whatever happened to Steve Reeves, who starred in this 1961 version of The Last Days of Pompeii? In the name of Rome, I place you under arrest for the murder of Consul Ascanius. Whatever happened to Steve Reeves, he's happily retired. This is uh, actually life I always wanted to leave, but live, but I didn't, I couldn't afford it. That's why I went into motion pictures to make a good living and put a few dollars in the bank, and so I could live the kind of life I wanted. Actually, when I started uh, being an actor at the age of 30, my goal was to retire at 45, and I was able to make it with all the money I needed for the rest of my life. 55. I've been retired for 10 years. When Steve made his first movie in 1957, he took his salary check and made a down payment on this 15-acre ranch in Valley Center in Southern California. Here he lives with his wife of 18 years and raises Morgan horses. Morgan horses are an American breed, compact, smart, spirited. These are the horses the cavalry rode in the Wild West days. They're versatile and gentle. Steve's very proud of his stable and enjoys training the Morgans. Stay. They have a uh, special way of moving that makes them uh, very elastic, you know. Their legs are like shock absorbers. The shoulders are set on a certain angle and the pasterns are a little longer than other horses, and they kind of absorb the shock as you ride, so there's no bouncing. So a guy who rides average will look good, a guy who rides great will look terrific. Here he is in 1947, Mr. America. He began his career at age 21 as a bodybuilder. He still keeps in shape, pumping yeah, iron. Out. I've always been in shape all my life, because I like it. It's my health insurance. When you feel in shape, you feel good about yourself. At 55, with 16 movies behind him, all foreign pictures, Steve Reeves is having it all his way, breathing easy. It's a way of life, just a way of life I like to do. I have my own uh, garden there. I have my avocado trees, orange trees, grapefruit trees, my dairy goats, my chickens. I'm all set. Another big hit of 1961, The Guns of Navarone. Oh, now, you see this bottom runner? 
The first time they send this hoist down for shells or charges, this runner should come to here. And the moment it does, it'll hit these two wires and we get a circuit. A circuit that will send up all my plastic explosives here, plus this little item that I borrowed here. Of course, they won't see these wires when I slap on some more grease. Are you sure it'll work? No guarantee, but the theory is perfectly feasible. You may remember that the guns of Navarone were in an enemy arms emplacement, and Niven and Peck are going to displace them. lost the great movie hero in 1961, Gary Cooper, his close friends, Soft paid their last respects. As Fresh as the sea, warm as the sunshine, shining on me. The Another group of stars smiling happily at the baptism of baby John Clark Gable in 1961. While John's father, Clark Gable, didn't live to see his only child, the little boy was welcomed by the most famous people in the land. The summer of 1961 saw the legendary Home Run Derby, the battle between the Yankees Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle to see who would be the new Home Run King. And for a while, Roger and Mickey were nip and tuck. I'm like a rubber ball, baby, that's all that I am to you. And Maris makes it. He hits his 60th home run of the season to tie Babe Ruth's 1927 record. Then he beat it. Bounce my heart around. Nineteen sixty one. Where were you when a tornado ripped across Chicago? When Italy went carnival crazy? When feather farming was a way to hatch out a living? Another look back just ahead. There were many surprises in nineteen sixty one, and in Chicago, one of the biggest and perhaps most unpleasant happened on March fourth as a tornado ripped through the city. It hit suddenly in an area that never expected it, the south side of Chicago. Because of extensive damage, two communities were declared disaster areas. Fortunately, everything is back to normal. Oh, well, it's hard, it's hard, Lord, it's and in 1961, the DuSable Museum of Afro-American History opened its doors for the first time. Founder and educator Dr. Margaret Burroughs began the museum in a house at 38th and Michigan. The first 16 years were so successful in serving those who sought knowledge of black history that the museum moved to larger quarters in Washington Park. This year marks the museum's 20th anniversary of service. The Oregio in Italy outdid itself in 1961 with the ultimate extravaganza, giant floats featured everyone from European statesmen to Count Dracula. And in Australia, 
the feather farms were flourishing. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. And on this farm there was a chick, the prettiest chick I know. With a little curve here and a little curve. While they are blindfolded, they lose their feathers to fashion. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. Ride em, cowboy. She had a walk, E-I-E-I-O. And how this walk would drive them wild, swinging to and fro. With Even without feathers, there is a certain pride. Man, this chick had wiggles to spare. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. 1961, the first Kennedy year, a year of new enthusiasm and excitement, a time when we seem to get a new lease on life. Throughout the country and in space, all systems were go. We had a new hero in an era that was all too short. I'd like to thank the guy who wrote the song that made my baby fall in love with me. Ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-